the environmental state of the world is pretty bad. That's really forcing more and more people to ask what next, to look for solutions. By 2050, if some dramatic action isn't done, there'll be more items of plastic in the world's oceans than living creatures. We need to commit to not only limiting harm, but we also have a much more proactive approach to the future. We need to find a way to coexist and to be prosperous. We really need to look at the linear take-make-waste model. We need to look at something different, and we think that that different model could be a circular economy. Circular economy is really based on three principles. To eliminate waste and pollution, to keep products and materials in use for longer, and to regenerate natural systems. Well, design is a, is a tool. It's a problem-solving tool primarily. Many of the big global issues that we face in today can be addressed by design thinking. We need you, the brilliant designers of products, packaging, clothing, objects we use every single day to help us create a better future, a more sustainable future, a regenerative future. The beauty of tech is it can act as an accelerator. It's an enabler to support design of new products and new systems, and in turn supports the sustainable change that we simply must make. Designers have a huge role to play in the shift to a circular economy, but also millions of other people who are involved in the design process. And we estimate that's about 160 million people globally. I would ask designers, business leaders, to look a bit further down the track and ask what the future holds, what policy changes are coming, what are citizens asking for, and what supply chain risks do they expose themselves to if they are constantly dependent on finite resources that come out of a hole in the ground. The circular economy is really about regeneration, so not just reducing the harm and trying to do a bit less bad over time, but actually to, to have a positive impact, to restore, to regenerate so the future gets a bit better rather than just a bit less worse. SAP solutions touch 77% of the world's material flows. We really are unique in our ability to provide that end-to-end -end visibility that no other companies can do. Sustainability has, maybe for too long, been an add-on in a business strategy. But through technology, we have the opportunity, and it really is an opportunity to design the processes and databases required for designers everywhere. And that's really the opportunity here. We can just look around us and say, how could you redesign that for a circular economy? It's truly time for designers to have the insight that they need to make informed circular design choices and enable the circular economy itself. Hello everyone. Welcome to the Circular Design Project, a series of curated talks which are part of the Global Design Forum. This is a unique collaboration between SAP, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and the London Design Festival, a series focused on the circular economy and regenerative business as a framework for positive global impact. My name is Jeremy Myerson. I hold the Helen Hamlin Chair of Design at the Royal College of Art, and it's my privilege to be moderating today's session. The overarching ambition of this project, as you've just seen in the video, is to engage the world's 160 million designers in this topic. And that's a lot of designers, I can tell you. And to showcase what can be achieved if business designers and technologists work together. The talk you're tuned into right now is on plastics. Food and fashion will follow later today. And there will also be another panel at the end of October, closer to COP26, the all important UN climate change conference that takes place in November. Our conversation now is looking at the challenges of plastic pollution and the role of design in shifting away from our current linear take make waste system. You've already heard in the video a couple of definitions of what we mean by circular economy and regenerative business 
all about working in ways that support positive outcomes for nature. But I want to share a few simple stats with you to get us all thinking on this subject. Um, you heard from Ben Evans that there could be more plastic than fish in the ocean by 2050. This is according to a report by Ellen MacArthur and the World Economic Forum. But did you also know that only 9% of all plastic produced is recycled? A UNEP report says that only 12% is incinerated, the rest goes to landfill. There are an estimated 8.3 billion tonnes of plastic produced since the 1950s. That's the, that's the equivalent in weight to more than 800,000 Eiffel Towers, according to a report in The Guardian. And finally, 2 million plastic bags are used every minute worldwide, according to EcoWatch. Think about it. So if that's not enough to get us all fired up on this subject, I don't know what is, but um, we've got a fantastic panel of experts to discuss the picture, and I'd like to introduce them all now. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Paul Priestman, chairman of, and founder of Priestman Good, industrial designers known for delivering complex high profile transport projects all over the world. And Paul's design firm has also recently explored alternative solutions for food packaging with an exhibition at the Design Museum. I'd like to introduce Anne Pogampol, um, who leads design and innovation activities within the Zero Waste Living Lab, a program by Social Venture building studio on VU. The Zero Waste Living Lab is pioneering the circular economy domain by piloting and building several reuse and refill ventures. I'd like to welcome EJ Kenny, Senior Vice President and Global Head of Consumer Products at SAP. Uh, EJ is responsible, he's got a vast portfolio, including the food, beverage, home care, personal care, fashion and consumer durable segments, as well as the agribusiness sector across all industries. And, and finally, Safia Qureshi of Club Zero, an award-winning architect, innovation designer, and educator. Um, uh, Safia launched Studio Detail in 2015 to build projects with high social and environmental impact. And she then incubated and launched Cup Club, returnable packaging system for drinks in 2018. So we've got plenty of design on this panel, plenty of activism and plenty of business acumen. Um, I'm gonna start with Safia, um, if I could come straight to you. Um, and can you paint a picture for us um, in an overarching way? I mean, what do you think are the key challenges for designers as we face this mountain of plastic pollution? <laughs> well, first of all, Jeremy, it's lovely to be here. Um, and uh, I, I actually did my um, architecture MA at the RCA. So uh, we've, we've both been uh, in very similar spaces, no doubt. Um, so quickly, I'd like to sort of flip this and I wouldn't say it's a, it's a challenge. I, I'd call it an opportunity, first of all. So I think for designers coming into this space and generally waking up to 2021 challenges that we design around, it's an opportunity for us to find new ways and new innovative, exciting ways to make uh, the world around us a better place, more sustainable, less CO2 consuming, et cetera, and less wasteful. So I think for designers, this is a fantastic brief, if anything else, and it's an opportunity to reevaluate how we, whether it's consume, whether it's food and beverage, which is our, our kind of area, um, and whether it's uh, to do with, uh, buying products differently, accessing products differently, so whether you're returning or refilling versus uh, just simply purchasing it off the shelf and throwing away the packaging, how can you um, change the way that you consume um, on, on a daily basis. So I would say it's, it's an opportunity, I think it's a new brief, um, and I think designers should be more uh, than ever before attuned to uh, developing products that have clearly an end of life um, high probability or some kind of component of that is thought through or considered when you're actually designing it, like what is going to happen to it? Where does it go? 
how many times can I potentially use this? Does it need to be serviced? Does it need to be in fact within a different business model altogether? So this kind of comes within the framework of um, you know, industrial design, this is thinking about service design, this is thinking about you know, not just a product, but how does this product exist in the system? And then on the consumer side, how do you make this available to consumers? How do you let them know it exists? How do you make it super easy and, and effective and exciting to use? And how do you optimize the product itself as opposed to just trying to sell it, sell it on the basis of this is more sustainable, but selling it on the basis of this is a better experience. A very interesting, uh, uh, Safia, um, uh, from the point of view of reframing it as a series of opportunities. I hope we haven't lost you for long there. Um, uh, uh, but very nice opening points. Can I turn to Paul uh, Priestman, another RCA graduate? Um, uh, um, but Paul, you know, your firm worked with some, you know, very big industrial uh, players. What, from your perspective, is the role of design in the circular economy and how well understood or established is the principle? Yeah, well, thank you, Jeremy, and uh, uh, welcome, everybody. Um, well, I think design, engineering and science is, is absolutely integral to the shift to the circular economy. And it's all about rethinking systems to stop waste being created in the first place. You know, recycling must be seen as the last resort. and. You know, coming back to your point, Jeremy, I, I, I think the good news is that on some of the very big projects we're working on, um, this issue is definitely part of the design brief now, and it's definitely there. Um, it's not there all the way yet, and we need to speed it up, but at least it's there. Uh, and we work in, in many big transportation projects, and I, I think it's becoming a, a almost a, that these companies are beginning to think that it, it is a, a an issue that, that they need to have a public face on and they, they can't just let it sit. I mean, we were designing um, hotel rooms uh, recently and, and part of the brief was, well, what happens in the end life of this hotel room? And it, the driving force was, was thinking about that, wouldn't it be disastrous to have pictures of, of wastage of, from their hotels on uh, being broadcast, which would damage their brand? But at least they're getting there, if you see what I mean. Um, so the role of design, I mean, Again, I think there are a number of things that designers can bring to it. So design for longevity, which is mentioned just recently, um, and modularity. And when we're designing things like trains, um, modularity allows these products to last longer. And um, when we're designing a product that's going to last 30 or 40 years, modularity is really important. So you can take some elements out of it, but the main product remains and can be get, kept uh, useful for longer. And then we're thinking about design for dis disassembly, end of life, uh, re reusing the, the precious materials and, and, and the plastics and mono materials. So as you're designing each of the components that make up a design, you're trying to keep the raw material as it is. And we all know that spraying a piece of plastic then limits its recyclability and reusability. And then the last thing is future proofing, of course, um, because if you can think ahead, I mean, we're designing products that won't come into service for five years, um, we have to think about what the world will look like then. So what we're trying to do as designers, I think, is to encourage and inform. And that's why we at Priestman Goo do self-initiated projects and, and particularly looking at the recent project we, we've just launched, which is looking at takeaway packaging. And this is a, a massive growth area, given the, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people have a choice. You order your, your takeaway food or whatever, and it turns up in a plastic bag with plastic containers and plastic and plastic. Um, so how can we make a difference? Because I think people do want to make the right choice, but there is limited choice in certain areas. And you know, the whole takeaway delivery is, 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 a, is a bigger issue because of the amount of congestion and pollution that is produced in cities with, with deliveries of, of rushing to get a banana to you at 50, in 50 seconds. So um, I think what we're trying to do is, is, is sort of engage and inform. Um, and the great news is from this project, we're actually working with a restaurant chain to actually look at this issue about how we can actually have um, packaging which is uh, reusable and uh, continually reused. That's very, very interesting. So you're getting some traction in, in the kind of industry, in the big in the big business fields in which you operate, 
Yeah. If I could turn to Anne, um, there's a famous definition of design to do, to design is to decide. And I'm interested to know how designers can integrate and embed new practices and make the right material choices or find ways to recycle the used plastics as best as possible without compromising on quality, because there's always this balance. Um, in your own work, how have you embedded new practices? How have you explored these new ways to work? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, happy to be sharing. So actually, I think one part is, of course, the material choice and plastic in itself is not always uh, the worst. I mean, it is really, really durable and versatile. Nonetheless, of course, the way we're currently using it and at the rate we're disposing it, that's really problematic. And of course, as, as I think Safi already touched upon it, like the material itself is only one, one component of the whole. So it's really, I think, uh, an awesome opportunity for designers to really think about designing the whole system and how we can actually reimagining our supply chains. And in that sense, also really deliver products in a new manner. And of course, within the kind of material choices, you really want to go through the whole life cycle. So how, where is my part, like, where is my, um, my material coming from? What kind of extraction mode is used for that? That's incredibly impactful, of course. But also um, when you then go along in the use phase, like how long is this product going to be used for? Is that for a long, long period or just a, a couple of seconds eventually? And then really choose like what type of a kind of, cycle within the circular economy um, kind of models you, you're choosing. Is that going to be the technical or is it going to be more on the biological um, cycle that really matches actually your, your solution? And in that case, um, based on that, of course, also as Paul already touched upon, it's really the question what's going to happen to your product at the end of its life. Do you want to disassemble it? Can you actually reuse parts of it for a new manner? Or um, yeah, do you actually design something that's just going to stay in the loop? for an incredibly long time. And that usually encounters also thinking beyond the material and really actually reimagining new kind of business models that really design for packaging, for example. We have one uh, example, it's called CoinPack. That's a platform that actually provides all kind of household products and food items in uh, reusable packaging. And these packaging, they just stay in the loop for an incredibly long time. Consumers bring it back and as such, there, of course, the material choice is really essential to, as you already said, uh, really ensuring the quality of the product. And then it stays in the loop forever. And, at the, and of course, at the end of the life cycle, it still can be recycled. And I think for these type of material choices, it's also incredibly important what we see at NVUs to really think about the context you're in. For example, in Indonesia, where we're working a lot, um, recycling facilities are very scattered. So choosing the material choice there is also influenced by what, what kind of infrastructure is available to what happens to your material afterwards. Uh, that's very, very interesting to get into the, into, the, into the chemistry and the detail of the materials. Um, if I could turn to EJ, um, you know, with a, with a, from a business perspective, who are the brands and organizations leading the way in this area? Are there some beacons out there that we can point to? Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with uh, you and everyone here today. And, and there absolutely are some beacons in the industry. Um, but I think to, to really understand who's leading, it's, it's important to begin with why they're leading. And this goes really far beyond just socially responsible actions. Uh, you know, brands that are leading in sustainability because they're doing so because they see that the take, make and waste cycle is a risk to, to their business and also that they're seeing that consumers are now making informed, conscious-based uh, buying decisions that, and that um, the sustainability of the products that they choose is a key decision factor of how they choose to spend their uh, uh, very valuable disposable income. Uh, matter of fact, there was some research done from uh, New York uh, uh, University uh, Stern School of Business that looked at uh, not only doing good is makes uh, for good business. Over the past four years, uh, although only 16.7% of the category uh, products were sustainably marketed, they represented over 56% of the total category growth. So in other words, sustainably marketed products were growing 7.1 times faster than non-sustainably marketed products. 
So the consumer fundamentally has changed. The consumer is forcing consumer products, companies and brands to think about sustainability in a different way and to, and to think more broadly across their entire network. And as was mentioned, when it comes to plastics and circular economy, I think that we could categorize leading brands in a couple different ways. One, you've got the brands that are uh, looking at regeneration as a principle into their business strategy. They're rethinking how they design, reuse. They're rethinking how they, they look at their entire network of business partners, which is, can be a very complex network. And they're going beyond this just doing no harm. They're really looking at proactively creating a positive impact on nature. And we've seen shifts in organizations incorporating these principles into their strategy and trying to embed it in all aspects of their business. Uh, Unilever is a great example of this with a recently updated Compass uh, initiative that really seeks to make sustainable living common. PepsiCo has their own PepsiCo positive initiative that really seeks, once again, not just to eliminate waste, but rather to make positive impacts on nature. And Adios has this great strategy around own the game, where they want to have reusable materials in almost all of their products by 2025. So these are great examples of companies that are leading, but they're leading it not only because they know it's the right thing to do and that, that these challenges that we face as a, as a world are uh, right here in front of us and we need to act. They're also doing it because there's an economic driver. There is a, there's a significant change that has happened in the marketplace. And that is that change is really driven by the consumer. And lastly, there's companies that are leading maybe in a different way, that they're, they're leveraging design principles, they're leveraging design professionals to innovate at the product level. And companies like Carlsberg or Absolute have done some very unique things around packaging, moving to prototypes that are made from sustainably sourced wood fiber instead of uh, plastic and or glass um, uh, types of packaging materials. So I'm excited about the future. Uh, there are some really beacons in, in our industry. And um, in the more we can create financial incentives and reduce some of the friction that exists today, we're gonna see more and more companies take on innovation and leverage design and designers uh, capabilities to create this regenerative business uh, outcomes that we all seek. Thank you, EJ. I think that's a really good overview and quite positive about the future from a business perspective. But business strategy is one thing and material composites are another. Behavior is another thing altogether. And I wanna come back to Safia and ask you about behavior. What can we do as citizens? It's more than just recycling or banning combustible cups. What are the new behaviors that need to be adopted? Um, I'm thinking particularly of the work that you've done in this area. Yeah, so I guess the, the, the update is we've recently launched Club Zero. So we used to be called Cup Club and uh, we rebranded to Club Zero, launched a major partnership with uh, one of the biggest food delivery platforms called Just Eat. Um, and it's an interesting journey because we, uh, previous to this, we're market leading with the highest volume of uh, reuse orders through our platform um, with a focus in beverages. And that was very much in bulk orders across business hosts or IE, what we, what is also known as offices. So in that environment, the behavior was a lot more, I guess, um, simply managed because a bit like the difference between internet and intranet, intranet is just simple communications within a couple of people to let everybody know. And internet is like a massive ocean that you exist in. So these are two very different worlds. So now we're in the massive ocean that uh, we exist in and it's an interesting uh, journey, but the thing that what we're learning um, is consumers are super interested and excited. So we have a very, very high impression rate. Um, and what we're also seeing is really high conversion. So they're being compelled to find this very exciting and then get involved and find out more and how to download and how to use, et cetera. And so there is a appetite and then specifically focusing on um, the UK market at the moment. Um, I can't speak for the entire European landscape at this stage. But um, the main behavior that we are noticing essentially is awareness building really. So it's it's creating um, options for people and laying it out upfront and then making it easy for them. So the behavior that you want to see is really fundamentally only 
possible if you leave a lot of breadcrumbs and you make it very simple for a customer to understand what you're asking them to do. Um, and the way that we perform the whole system is that we just try and replicate it to as close to possible as what they are already used to. So we're not asking them to change their behavior. We're just giving them more options. And the way that we position it is very simple. In the same way as we've seen uh, the optionality for customers beyond meat in the form of like 50 bajillion brands that sit within that category of alternative meats. And in the same way as we've seen optionality for customers beyond dairy, and we know all of the various brands that sit within that as an optionality, what we're saying is here's an option, which is an alternative to landfill packaging. And we are the reusable option. So that's really how you drive behavior is to identify through language awareness building and communications and then produce a product that is simply going to just lead them towards what you're trying to get them to do. As opposed to saying, you must do something very different <laughs> and inconvenience yourself to go about doing it. That's just not something that you're going to see high conversion around, so. It's very much about choice rather than coercion or guilt tripping. And, Correct. Uh, yeah. Correct. Um, if I could come to, back to Paul, I mean, given this consumer landscape, given the business changes that EJ has talked about, and given the material changes that Anne have talked about, what can designers do to get over the barriers around regenerative design? Um, you know, what can they do now? Um, what's on the action list? Well, we try and do everything we possibly can, of course. Um, but I mean, going to, back to one of EJ's uh, points, uh, I'll give an example. Um, we're, we're designing the new trains for Via Rail, the Canadian train operator at the moment. And um, this might sound a very small point, but um, we've, we've got water dispensers on board, um, it's cold and hot water. And this enables people to use their re refillable bottles and um, not, again, of course, using re um, the disposable plastic bottles that, that are currently used on most, most uh, <laughs> trains. So um, this is then used as a, as a communication tool uh, to encourage people to do the right thing. And, and it's an enabler. I think this allows people to do the right thing. And um, companies like Via that are able to do that, is, it's, it's going in the right direction. I mean, I was on a train just recently and you're trapped in your seat and someone offers you a cup of coffee and they, you get a, a cup and you get some milk in a plastic container, you get a plastic spoon, you're sort of trapped. <laughs> you know, I want a coffee, but I can't do anything about it. And I think that's where we, we just have to allow people to make the right choice. Um, and I think design has everything to do with that. Um, and it, without going into all of the, the, the massive amount back of house waste in the, in, the, in, the, in the food and preparation area, I know there's a, a talk later on about that. Um, so I think, you know, I, I think design and communication and, and, and enabling people to make the right choices is, is the thing to do right now. And, you know, I, I do, I do, you know, I so shriek in horror about the wastage due to the pandemic and, um, you know, the plastics and, and the, the, that have, have, uh, have been uh, disposed of. And, um, and that's a backward step, but I, I'm still positive we're going forward in the right direction. I mean, I just want to pick up on the pandemic thing and I want to come to Anne on this because, you know, there was just before the pandemic, you know, a head of steam in the design industry, at least from my perspective, around sustainable packaging and, and addressing the issue of plastics, which we have to remember was, was the golden material for designers. It enabled all kinds of things in the post-war years. And um, for many years, it was a very attractive uh, notion for designers. Of course, the pandemic um, uh, reversed some of these trends suddenly we weren't going to reuse, retouch, recycle things. We were going to have one use disposable. Um, so, I mean, my question to you, Anne, is, is, is as we move on from the pandemic to make better choices, um, how, do we, how do we get out of pandemic thinking? How do we move forward? You know, how do we respond as a design community? Yeah, I think uh, definitely uh, that has been a challenge, of course, at the start of the pandemic. So there really has been a rise in single-use plastic consumption. But I think the good news is also that um, just a, a couple of months after, you saw actually enormous uh, amount of studies arising showing that 
Of course, the virus can be transmitted through uh, materials and particular also plastics. So it's actually not a material choice anymore, but it's actually a question of your sanitization process. So I think there is really good news for kind of refill and reuse models and other kind of um, opportunities in that space. And what also the pandemic has brought with it, and I think that's also really great news that we've seen in our programs in the Netherlands, but also in Malaysia and Indonesia actually, that the Boston Consulting Group has shown that there's a really increasing evidence and um, desire from consumers for more environmental um, solutions. So there is really a drive from consumers and that actually um, became bigger throughout the pandemic, that awareness uh, that we have to kind of act upon it and not just do the talking. And I think that has really actually been um, really fueling um, also really new models to emerge. And I think as Safi already put it, the kind of um, inner challenge is always an opportunity, right? So what we've seen, for example, in Indonesia is also actually the pandemic leading to a lot of food delivery services, um, food delivery uh, orders, of course, but um, yeah, that is also an opportunity to uh, where we build a new model called ALA. So that's a kind of returnable, reusable food system for exactly that type of order. So you can just get your food in an even more convenient manner. So there's no leakage. That's not a whole bunch of styrofoam being at your house at the end of the day, but actually um, it's just gonna be picked up again and you just have your food in a very beautiful uh, reusable container. So I think there is a lot of opportunities in that field. And I think actually the pandemic has really shown us that their change can happen really fast. And I think that we are quite adaptable and we have to build a lot more um, yeah, resilience within our kind of way of designing. And I think they're really coming into with regenerative design where we kind of think about our um, approaches there a lot more holistically is really a great opportunity and actually yeah from 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 my point of view it's actually also really an opportunity that that has been shown there well that, yeah that's a very very interesting uh, take on on moving away from the pandemic if i can come back to ej and a little bit closer to home with with sap um how can digital technology we saw in the film a reference to how digital technologies could be part of the answer but how can they enable the acceleration of the circular economy and support regenerative business? And what can be the role of SAP in that? Well, Jeremy, uh, digital technologies are going to play a vital role in enabling and accelerating the design and the realization of circular economy and regenerative business strategy. Because really, at the root of the problem is a transformation from linear processes to networked and circular flow, of whether it's products, materials, financial information, or insights across organizational boundaries. And uh, companies realize they have to cover the entirety of their value chain, not just simply what, what happens in their four walls. And this simply, it cannot be achieved with yesterday's kind of siloed, uh, optimized what's in my four walls kind of thinking. Rather, the circular economy must be kind of fueled through much more intelligent systems, systems that can sense and respond across company boundaries at scale, because there's a large scale problem when we start to talk about circular economy and regenerative uh, issues. You're dealing with trillions of items across uh, vast uh, geographic boundaries. So scale is really, really important. And I think the other thing is systems have to unite business partners together with new levels of transparency, new levels of trust, and it, and it should um, create for design professionals, new insights into where waste occurs, new opportunities across the value chain. So, so many designers really lack the full transparency and insights around how products are used, how products are reused. So to really create this regenerative business approach, insights, transparency across organizational boundaries is gonna be absolutely vital. Um, the other thing is companies have to face uh, things that we none of us really enjoy, the, the, the increasing regulatory environment, uh, especially as it looks at uh, obligations around uh, packaging and uh, plastic taxes. And we're in the process right now of uh, making, uh, the visible, making visible those sources of waste and creating an environment that companies can manage their regulatory environment 
in a way that highlights and pro provides visibility into those sources of waste. Because I think a lot of the problem, uh, you have some very well-intentioned professionals, whether design professionals or business professionals, that simply don't have visibility into where the waste is occurring. They don't have the, the tools and the technology to be able to affect change in the moment to be able to prevent future waste. And I'm really proud of the fact that SAP has taken a collaborative approach with our customers. We've got many of the leading brands and consumer products that are working with us to provide uh, our um, uh, first uh, solution in this foray um, uh, for circular economy that's going to provide this transparency, this level of trust, and this ability to create insights. And it's centered really around three basic priorities. How to eliminate the waste, and then second, how to circulate materials, and then third, how to increase overall business value and regenerate through innovative business model approaches so that we can shift from production to much more reuse models. And these digital technologies, and uh, as I mentioned, the very first one that we're coming to market with here this November is responsible design and production. And it was uh, co-innovated with a lot of uh, the top brands in the industry. And it's really our flagship pro uh, product because it has circular design right from the beginning. And um, it, it'll be something that will not only help companies be compliant to new plastics taxes and additional regulatory uh, a burden, it will also provide the fuel and the insight to help designers uh, design products, to design systems, design, design overall uh, ecosystems that help reduce, reuse, and create regenerative uh, business uh, strategies. And, and lastly, one other thing I'm really proud of that's innovative, we've been working with the World Economic Forum and the Global Plastics Action Partnership um, to uh, put a solution in in Ghana to help them reduce plastics waste where they have less than 20% of plastic recycled today. And it's a very inclusive strategy. It's providing small handheld uh, types of solutions for plastic pickers to be able to be out in the field, to be able to reuse, to measure the volume and to provide this tra transparency and trust. So this rural sourcing as we call it, uh, has been applied to the circular economy problem in a very unique way and it has dramatic impacts on local economies and local uh, uh, regions. So uh, there's a lot of innovation that can be applied and uh, I'm excited about what the future holds. Well, I think that's a very, very uh, good note to start bringing things to a conclusion. A massive subject, only 45 minutes to talk about it. And we've raced through our time, but we've got five minutes left and I just want to ask each of you to make a closing statement and I want you to a short closing statement just around the subject of COP26. What do you think is needed to create change in the run-up to COP26 and beyond? What's the one thing, one message, one action that you'd like to see in the run-up to COP26? Um, does anybody want to kick off? I don't want to... Uh, Paul, you're that you're smiling. So I'll let <laughs> that's a that's a really 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 difficult one. Um, I think it, we just need to have some very clear and demonstrable um, examples of 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 the the advantages of doing this, so that everybody really gets the message and understands. And it's and it's an, it's allowing to people to be enabled to do the right thing. And yeah. I think design is absolutely key in that. Yeah, case studies like the one in Ghana, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, Safia. What would be your big, big change creator for COP26? Um, well, COP26 is predominantly industry. So I'm, I'm going to assume you, you're you specifically targeting industry in your question and not consumers, because that's very much an industry event. It's not an open event. Um, I would say specifically for industry, um, I mean, I've, I've attended and had the privilege of, of, of being at Davos a number of times. And I find most of these events are a complete waste of time. Um, because there are just a number of pledges and people saying, oh, we must do X or we need to do X. And there's actually very little action that's actually happening. So what I would like to see is actually some announcements from the government in the run up to talk about the, uh, the I guess, the mirroring um, 
position on what items of single use plastics are actually going to be banned in the same way as we've seen across European Union as of July we've effectively seen a removal of all styrofoam packaging from the market you're not allowed to sell it you're not allowed to distribute it you're not allowed to do anything with it and similarly we've seen a ban on an implementation of the EU directive so my, my challenge that. would be to you know Chop, chop, hurry up. Uh, we're not here forever. I'd like to see what the mirroring result of that is for the UK government and the UK government actually making some announcements alongside that as opposed to just kicking the can down the road. Um, that would be my first one. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to pass to EJ. Thank you, Safia. Uh, Safia. Yeah, I, I would just summarize that I think that um, we have to create a positive financial incentive for companies. Uh, going beyond just doing what's right, making sure to reinforce um, the value proposition that, that doing what's right in this area is good business. It drives growth in other areas, it drives other business value. And rather than doing things alone, the collective power of pulling industries together is absolutely uh, enormous. So um, that one thing that one takeaway that we've learned is uh, rather than building individual solutions for a handful of customers, pulling them together in a collaborative environment to attack these tough problems is definitely the way to go. Collaboration. Thank you. And finally, Anne, in a nutshell, your, your advice for COP26. Yes, I think it's really an opportunity to kind of uh, work towards making uh, new solutions and that including refill and reuse models everything within the circular economy become the new normal. And that means it's actually really touching up on all levels. That means about uh, touching up on the financial world. What does that mean in terms of uh, subsidies and leveling the playing field for also new solutions? Um, but also, of course, that means um, really incorporating that within the education of designers as well. And I think there's also just a huge opportunity for um, design that we really have the power and the tools to kind of create solutions that are really affordable, accessible for everybody, and that are incredibly convenient that we actually, um, yeah, we're just gonna choose that. Well, thank you very much indeed, um, all of you for your contributions. While we've been talking, there's been an amazing stream on chat of links and comments and questions and, and I wasn't able to bring it into the conversation because I wanted to hear from our experts, um, but do have a look at the chat, everybody. Really rich subject, really rich discourse. Can I say a huge thank you to Paul Priestman of Priestman Good and Pog and Pole, uh, EJ Kenny of SAP and Safia Qureshi of Club Zero. Um, thank you for your contributions. Thank you everybody who tuned in today.